Okay, so I'm here with my boss James, who's going to be discussing his journey as a digital landlord. So I guess the first question is, what made you want to become a digital landlord? I never really planned out to be a digital landlord. Um, as the business started to evolve, and I realised we needed um, inquiries through the, through the business. The more inquiries we get, the more sales that we'd get, the more profit basically we'd make. So I realised that SEO was an important part, which is obviously search engine optimization. Um, and I knew that owning a lot of the assets was important as well. So where I started to speak at a lot of different events and meet a lot in a lot of masterminds and stuff like that, I started to realise a lot of people was doing client work for other people's websites. So what I was thinking was if I could build the sites and generate them the leads, which is what they wanted to make the profit, I'd own the assets and then I could build that out in my own way without a client saying, I don't like the look of that site or what you're doing here or why you're doing this. Yeah. It was my site. So as long as I generated them the leads, it was happy. So I think a lot of people be interested kind of in this industry. Like what training did you have to do really to learn this trade and to become a digital landlord? So the main, I'd say the main training you need to do is SEO and learn the trade of SEO, everything about SEO. And then people are probably going to ask, well, where do you learn SEO? And there's a lot of online courses, a lot of videos, tutorials on YouTube and stuff like that. A lot of it's outdated. A lot of it is incorrect. Um, first four or five years, I watched days and days and days worth of videos that now I look back and they're all incorrect. Yeah. So um, you've just got to kind of learn on the job. Um, you've got to build out sites, test, test, test. So probably our biggest arm at the moment is people that are physically testing stuff still to this day. Now, after a decade of being in the industry, we're still checking what content briefs work the best, what content optimization tools are the best, what type of links are the best, what, what velocity of links are the best. So it's um, it's never evolving kind of trade of what you need to do. But in general, you need to learn the SEO side, unless you're going into paid social media or building up social media groups or running PPC and stuff like that. But generally, digital landlord is owning the assets of a website and then renting that out, which you need to rank organically. Yeah, because I suppose it's like what you've alluded to there, like you can't limit yourself to one part of digital marketing. If you're going to learn, you need to learn about every single part so that you've got enough knowledge to actually implement it. Yeah. Probably some people go wrong in digital marketing in general where they focus in on one thing and then they try, they do that really, really well and then they have nine other or ten other factors that they're completely ignoring yeah, and they yeah. wonder why they don't rank or they can't, you know. So it's like with the gas it is a holistic approach. So it's nice having amazing content, but if you don't have any nice visuals, um, you don't have any videos on there. You can also rank the images in Google videos on Pinterest. Pinterest is a massive driver of traffic. Yeah. And that referral traffic on the behavioral signals that you get through SEO is massive. People don't talk about behavioral signals enough. Everything's always obsessed by content and links where behavioral signals are some of the biggest part of, of the rankings in today's algorithm. So whether it's referral traffic from YouTube, from Pinterest, from Twitter, from Facebook groups and stuff like that. Yeah, everything is encompassing into being one big digital marketing strategy. Yeah, definitely. So with all that training and everything, and obviously with it being implemented, what do you feel it really takes to become a successful digital landlord? Good question. Um, persistence. Persistence. And more persistence. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, on a serious note, like, SEO is an ever-evolving industry. We've, um, we've spoke about this a few times, where every day is a school day. Um, things change all the time. People, too many people quit. That's what it is. Mm. Um, there's a classic saying of 97% of people quit and they're employed by 3% of the people that didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's about getting through them pain barriers, getting through what works in today's algorithm um, and adapting to what works. So it's definitely persistence, um, consistently looking to improve. So if you don't, if, you, if you're on a flat line, you're actually going behind because your competitors are catching you. So again, I just repeat it, persistence. Yeah, continuing to grow and continuing to actually yeah. find different areas that can succeed. Because I think that's the thing, you can be sometimes deterred from something if it doesn't go very well or you think that didn't work, so therefore it doesn't work. Whereas yeah, exactly. actually it's making sure that you implement it properly and at least give it a try. I think yeah. in certain elements of SEO, you're always going to be on marketing in general. You're going to be better at certain parts than others. Yeah. And the parts that you're you know, not as good at, it's kind of more of a reason to just keep going at it. Yeah, and eventually yeah. you'll, you'll get there. I think a lot quit too soon as well with regards to, um, let's say, article velocity or link velocity. Mm. You need a lot of it. Yeah. So some people go and build 20 sites and 20 backlinks and they say, all right, stop works and give up. And yeah. they might have got themselves in the background ranking for maybe three, four hundred keywords in position number eight or nine. Yeah. Now, generally, the top three, top five results get all the traffic. Yeah. 
So if you go and build everything up from not ranking to being position number seven, you're probably still not going to be earning any money. Yeah. But you've done the brunt of the work, and maybe another 10 articles and 10 backlinks, or, uh, depending on the niche, you're not that far away. No. And it's that whole digging for the gold and stuff, oh, it's looking for the diamonds, and you're very close, but you're there, oh, there's nothing here, and yeah. you give up, and it's just, that's where the persistence comes in, in making certain that if you're going to do it, you need to look to cover the topic in its entirety and be ambitious enough to make certain I'm going to go for this until I win. Yeah. So obviously, with all that being said, what have you found most challenging during your time kind of in the in the road to becoming a digital landlord? Ooh, um, most challenging, I'd say, onboarding the right staff. Mm. Um, so to start with at the time, we, we onboarded quite a lot of SEO specialists, SEO gurus, mm. SEO experts. And they came in and they say it's, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Um, and with the algorithm changing so much, you need to change. So some of these, not not branding all older people, but people that have got experience and not got the mindset from a young age in being every day is a school day, it became difficult. So that's why I went down the apprenticeship route. I went down the whole, they need to come in with a fresh mind to make certain they've got the right mindset, to make certain that we're systemizing everything so that the next people that come along the training's that a little bit easier, but I don't need to do the training for the next person. My middle managers can be doing the training to the apprentices, then they progress up the ladder. They're then doing the training for the next apprenticeships, but it all takes time. And there's times where I could complete a task myself in two minutes, and it might take me 10 minutes to do the SOP. I might lie down and just do the task. Yeah, yeah. But then it's actually, no, you've got to make the system because that two minutes is going to be escalated 10,000 times in the years to come. Yeah. So. That is breaking that model of being making certain, one of the books that I read, the EMIF Revisited, changed the way that I still think to this day, where it's about being system dependent, not people dependent. And that whole being systems dependent, longer down, further down the line, it just saves you so much time. But it's just breaking that mold, the mindset of just like, sometimes you just want to roll your sleeves up and get it done. Yeah. And it's actually better not to do that in, at times. Yeah, and that temptation can exist, obviously, from putting in the years of doing it yourself. So you're so used to, yeah. I'm going to find out this problem, I'm going to work this out. And actually, when you've actually got the systems together, it's much easier then to take that bit of time, like you said, get it all you know, systemized. And then for the efficiency of the business, everyone can then obviously attack that problem you know, tenfold as opposed to just you doing it. And yeah. it saves you so much time and gives you more room to you know, embark on different endeavors as well. So yeah, that all makes sense. Yep. So this one's a bit of a nicer question, but what have you found most rewarding about this journey then? The most rewarding I'd say is the, the way we've set out the way that we work with clients is all our clients get a return on investment, otherwise they don't pay. So if, then, if they're renting out one of our sites and it's not generating inquiries, they don't pay rent. So they need to be seen to getting a return on investment. So long term, we've got clients. We don't want to be renting out our website is not generating them a return on investment, which then means that the switching is off. We need to find new clients and it's a consistent, we need a big, massive sales team. We don't have that much of a big sales team because it kind of sells itself. So, and it's reward, and the reason why it's rewarding is because when you've got a happy client base, your staff's happy. Because every phone call that your client's doing is generally a happy conversation about wanting more inquiries, coming to you for new services that they might be offering, or basically telling you, I want to pay you more money because this is working amazingly. So it's that whole, like, we generally get invited on a lot of the clients' Christmas dues because they like working with us. Yeah. And I think that's really important because there's times if people are doing client SEO and sometimes the client might be paying two, three, four thousand pounds a month and not knowing what they're getting. Mm -hmm. And they always see it as an expense where with us to see what they're paying us as an investment, not an expense. It's a completely different mindset and it just makes everything happier yeah. within the workplace with you saying that as well and kind of talking about investment uh could you go expand a little bit more about kind of you know the fact that obviously when sites do do well the investment does get pulled back into yeah exactly so um the first three four years we're not interested in making any profit whatsoever so when a client starts renting a site let's say it's a thousand pound a month we will spend the full thousand pound a month on content on links on social media on videos on infographics whatever it takes for us to build to get them as high up as we can or the keywords that make them the most profit. And what starts to happen is the reason why it takes so long to do that is that in six, seven, eight months time, we start to find new keywords in Google in Google Search Console. This starts coming up and then we start to ask the client questions like, what does this mean? And they're like, oh yeah, it's really profitable for us. Yeah. So like, but they didn't say it at first. Mm. 
And they're like, oh yeah, I didn't really think about that. Yeah. And then you end up coming across new keywords consistently. As those new keywords come along, you then need to do new articles, new backlinks, new videos on all them as well. So we want them to keep growing out and growing out and growing out. And we we don't want to target stuff that might generate them a lot of inquiries. At the end of the day, it's not about its quality over quantity. It's not about the quantity of inquiries that we generate. It's about the leads that convert and make them the most profit. Yeah. And then from that, then again, they're a happy client. They're making money. And that's that's our biggest drive to make certain the clients are making a return on investment. Yeah. So we spoke a lot about kind of your own personal growth within the company and kind of become a digital landlord. Um, how important for you do you feel it's been to actually work as part of a team in that process as well? Everything. Mm. Absolutely everything. Um, without a team, I am literally I'm zero. Mm. Um, you, there's so many moving parts that you need that you need the team to implement, whether it's testing at the front end to make it certain that systems are keep being updated, to make it certain that being me writing content, I'm not a content writer. So it's you better get in someone who's got the degree in English, that loves writing content, that loves reading and researching and writing. That's not my bag. I'm more I'm more of a businessman and more analytical. So if it was going to go into any role within SEO, it probably would be backlinks because I like the analytical side of it. Yeah. But you need to make certain that you've got the right people for the job, that you've got to mould them into their workplace. You've got to make certain that their mindset is done right as well. But the team is absolutely everything. Like, I can't stress enough that how important making certain that you've got the right people for the right roles, that they understand that any criticism that I give is constructive criticism for them to improve and them to develop as a person and them to improve their career as well. I think it's it's... it's definitely the most important part of what we do yeah and i think like you said there like that team doesn't happen straight away it has to be molded into being its own thing and yeah kind of the ethos of a company needs to be built from the ground up as opposed to i'm going to employ six or seven people and it's all going to work perfectly it's yeah. definitely a there's a lot of training sometimes not necessarily off the job but almost kind of the atmosphere of what people bring to the company yeah, and yeah, yeah. how the team works in a collective the, cul- the culture is massive as well yeah i mean look at your role yourself mm-hmm. so you started off as being an apprentice you mainly was in backlinks and now you're heading up content you're heading up a content team you're doing all the content briefs you're um, editing existing content that's being uploaded, you're doing progressive optimization. That's not what your role was at the start. Yeah. You've progressed into that role. Now, if I just had you in that one role, you wouldn't have evolved as a person. And, and since you then ended up moving into certain roles, you your, the culture of yourself became like more like yeah. a hungry yeah. for business growth again. Mm-hmm. Where And that's where you've got to look within the team and make it certain in the culture that they're at, they are happy. Yeah. And if they're not, seeing why they're not, and is it the role that they're playing, or is it that you've not set them enough targets? Because people love to hit targets. And then mini, then those of them mini wins along the way. It's enjoyable then for everyone within the journey. But yes, the team is, the culture in the team is absolutely massive. So during that process of kind of trying to find a team and trying to find your staff that are perfect to be able to mold, uh, you know, mold into, what kind of things do you generally look for in an individual when you're employing someone for your team? It completely varies on the role that you're taking on. Um, so if it's customer service, you've got to make certain they're quite confident on the phone, that they're willing to pick up the phone, um, speak to clients, speak to customers. If it's content writing, they don't need to be that sociable. They just need to love English and research and writing and reading and consistently look, wanting to evolve in the way that content's being written. Um, actually, the work that they put in, they're like really proud of what they've done. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Um, the, Politeness, being well educated, uh, just, I don't, I mean, I'm not literally all, they have to have straight A's and stuff like that. He, speaking to them within the interview, you've only got 30 minutes to an hour in an interview, so you've not got that long. So I, what I always like doing is, if I think the right role, I always take them on for a month. So just give them a month kind of trial period. See how they mould within the actual office. So do they get on with other members of staff? Because if they don't, well, they don't make it. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you've got to make certain that members of staff get on with each other. You've got to make certain that they're, they're always willing to learn. So in the first few weeks, I'll specifically get them jumping from one thing to another. And I'll specifically to try to test them out to be like, ah, do you know what I mean? So like, but then it ceases to see over the break. Because if they're going to break, when they've not got that much stress, they're going to break further down the line when they have to keep adapting yeah. and changing. So it's not just straight. Some people are just always looking at, a CV and going, oh, we need to employ them, they're all straight A's. They've got to fit within the team as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it does, I think it does vary quite a lot. 
So with all that being said, would you say as a final question, there's anything you tell yourself or tell your former self, sorry, about kind of, you know, what you do differently as a digital landlord? Yeah, I'd definitely say it's a lot harder um, than what, there's, there's times where people might read like a four hour work week and think, ah, that's it, four hours working a week and that's it, done and stuff like that. It's a lot, lot harder than what you think. Um, you've got to build the team. Uh, building the team's massive and really important. Um, and then you've got to have wild, crazy dreams, like way bigger expectations than what you ever think of. But then you've got to break them down into mini goals. So when you break them down into mini goals and you achieve those mini goals, the journey's fun. But if sometimes people set themselves massive, big targets and it might take them years and years and years to hit those targets. And in, in those years, they just never happen until they hit the target. Yeah. Where if you set yourself a big, big target, but you do like the Kaizen approach, where you slowly but surely going up, going up, going up, going up towards it, and you're winning, you're getting these little wins along the way, the journey is so much more fun. Yeah, brilliant. I think, to be fair, that kind of sums everything up. I don't think there's anything else you want to add, but, you know, other than that, that's... No, no, I think that's everything yeah. about being a digital Brilliant, yeah. Great talk to you. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah,